who has been who has not been to Cane Hill? Yeah. Okay, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good showing then. We're doing pretty good. Uh, Cane Hill is located in southwestern Washington County. We're about 18 miles southwest of Fayetteville. It's out Highway 62, like towards Farmington, Prairie Grove, and then you take a left on Highway 45 off of Highway 62. Uh, we were settled in 1827, uh, well prior to statehood. Uh, Cane Hill, I say, is the Fayetteville before Fayetteville was Fayetteville. Uh, it was the big city, and in fact, growing up in Lincoln, if we said we were going to town, that meant we were going to Fayetteville. But prior to 1850, if you said you were going to town, probably meant you were going to go to Cane Hill and do your shopping, or you are going to go to town and do whatever business you needed to do there. Uh, we were settled by Cumberland Presbyterians. They were moving out of eastern and western Tennessee and eastern Kentucky, and they were moving west as the United States was expanding, and they were spreading the gospel by horseback. That's the reason that they were there. Uh, this is a recreation of one of their uh, log cabins there in central Tennessee as they moved through. They stopped in Crystal Hill, Arkansas, which is just on the, this side of Little Rock down by the Arkansas River uh, for a few years, and they got tired of the flooding. I think they had probably heard about northwest Arkansas, and they had probably heard about the Ozarks, and they were obviously from the Cumberland Mountains and from the Smoky Mountains of eastern Tennessee, and I think that it probably sounded very appealing to them, especially if they were tired of the flooding, they wanted to get up in the mountains. And I think, I mean, this has not been written down anywhere, but I think they probably felt quite at home being out in Knoxville for a while. The Ozarks and the Smokies are, are very similar environments. And they, they quickly developed an identity on really four facets of everyday life. Obviously, the first of those was religion. That's why the folks settled Cane Hill in 1827. Uh, we have a, an extremely long history of Presbyterianism in Cane Hill, but we also have a significant, we had an early significant Methodist population uh, the Methodist Manse was the first Methodist church constructed in Cane Hill. Uh, the National Register listing says 1834, but we actually believe it's 1859. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But as far as Presbyterianism, uh, they, in their records, they say that they built their first log cabin in 1828, and it's described in their records as the old meeting house. It was located uh, up near where the Cane Hill Cemetery is today. If you're familiar with that area, it's a little bit northwest of the college. There are, there's nothing remaining of that. Uh, perhaps maybe one day some archaeological work might uh, cue us in on where exactly that was. Uh, by the 1850s though they decided to build a new fancy church, right? Uh, things change. And they actually built it uh, about two or three miles north of Cane Hill in the area that was referred to as White Church. Uh, there are also no photographs of that building but it probably looked very similar to this one from Center Hill, Arkansas. A simple white clapboard or, or lapboard siding church built in a vernacular style. And then in 1891, finally, they build the church uh, that's still there today that you can see on Highway 45, and it's still used as a church today. They still have services on Sunday. It's a beautiful Gothic Revival-style church. And then sometime in the, this is a debatable, sometime in the 20s to the 50s, they added stained glass windows, which are there in the church today, very beautiful. That was really common in the 1920s when folks had spendable cash, the Roaring Twenties. You would see family sponsor uh, one window and their, their plaque, but I've been told that maybe sometimes as late as the 1950s, they were still doing that in Cane Hill and the Cane Hill Church. So I've got some research to do there, but you'll see this. There are no stained glass windows in that, in that church at this time. This is a pretty early photograph. Uh, in fact, I, I mentioned the Methodist, but Cane Hill, actually the, the area south of Cane, Cane Hill called Salem Springs, they actually host the first annual conference session of the Methodist Church in Arkansas held near this point, nine miles south in 1833. Bishop Joshua Soul presided over the Arkansas Annual Conference, which was organized at Batesville in 1836. So we have a very significant Methodist population early on, but they are gone, and the Methodist Church, uh, it closes in 1904. And we know that because we have a great entry in the Presbyterian records where folks join the Presbyterian Church, and it says because the Methodist Church closed. So it gave us a, a nice date on that. Uh, just like I, I've heard of other churches here, you get more than four or five people in one group and they don't get along. So by the 1880s, they had already formed three Presbyterian churches in Cane Hill. It's a teeny tiny little town today, but it was a, it was a pretty happening place. Uh, the first one, though, the first folks that get there are the, the Cane Hill Congregation of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, established in 1828, and that dissolves in 1940. The town was well in decline by the 40s. 
Uh, the second one, the Salem Congregation of the Cumberland Church, was established in 1844. It became Presbyterian USA in 1905, and that's the church that's still in operation today. And then later in 1889, they established the Mount Bethel Presbyterian Church, and it was dissolved in 1919. So in their heyday, three Presbyterian churches. Uh, the other interesting aside to that is I always get good giggles, but that Methodist manse, that's how it's listed on the National Register. Methodists don't have a manse. They have a parsonage. But the Presbyterians were the last ones left in town, and they wrote the history. So it's known as a <laughs> Methodist manse. So again, so a lot of, a lot of religious history, and that's one of the big tenets. Uh, but the other big one is that the Presbyterians were very proactive, very forward-thinking on some things. And education became one of their central tenets while they were in Cane Hill. So the, most folks know of Cane Hill College. This is the, the building that's there today, as well as the female seminary located just south of that. Uh, Cane Hill School was established by the Presbyterians in 1834. It becomes one of the first public schools in the state of Arkansas. Uh, in that school, then, they have the first public library in the state of Arkansas. There are so many firsts out there because of this early settlement. Uh, but this was very forward-thinking to be educating the youth out on the frontier at the time. This was, but it was very important to them, and, and all the records, they, they note how important this is to them. Uh, they start giving out high school diplomas by 1850. It becomes uh, Cane Hill Collegiate Institute. Then in 1852, they give out some of the first college degrees. Again, very early on. Uh, they establish also the female seminary. It's called the Cane Hill Female Seminary, but it's actually in modern-day Clyde, Arkansas, just south of Cane Hill in 1852 in the same year. And by 1858, the college grounds had, had grown so much that it included four large buildings noted in the historic records. It's closed in 1861 for a lack of pupils. There's this thing going on in the Civil War. All the teachers and the students decided they were off to fight in the war. And then one of the, one of the biggest uh, hits to it is in 1864, um, most of Cane Hill is burned, including three out of the four buildings. So our, our Battle of Cane Hill is much earlier than this. We are the location for a battle we're called the Prelude to Prairie Grove, nine days before Prairie Grove. But it's not until 1864 that the town really gets hurt. And this is folks coming back through looting. This is Jenison's Jayhawkers. Most folks know this. And, and Jenison and some of his men uh, get court-martialed after the war. I don't know if you know all this. but uh, uh, And in his discharge papers, it's, it's listed for his atrocities at Pea Ridge and at Cane Hill. So it burned a little bit too much, apparently. Uh, Cane Hill also, not only are they uh, the first education, not the first center for higher education, that is one of the first four-year colleges west of the Mississippi, but then in 1875 they become the first co-ed university in the state of Arkansas, and so they move uh, women from the Cane Hill Female Seminary up to Cane Hill College. Uh, one building makes it through, I said three or four are burned during the Civil War. Uh, but the last remaining building is burned in 1885 by an arsonist. The story is a moonshiner that had been ran out of town, comes back and burns the last building down. Uh, the college is rebuilt and reopens in 1886, and the first classes resume in uh, the, uh, December of 1887, I think it is. And that's the building that you all see when you come to Cane Hill today. So that's an 1886 building. And it doesn't last long. The college closes in 1891. Uh, Cane, Cane Hill was being really outstripped and outsourced population-wise to Fayetteville by this time. In the late 1880s, plans were made for railroads across uh, northern Arkansas, and Cane Hill was adamant that they did not want the railroad. And, and in fact, they uh, fought it pretty hard. And they didn't, while they were very forward-thinking on some things, like education and things like that, they were not forward-thinking on business, and it ended up being the decline of the town. People often ask, well, what happened to Cane Hill? They fought the railroad. It gets built in Lincoln, and the first train runs in 1901, and it runs all the way up here to Springdale. And so we think of, you know, people can no longer ship those apples uh, by a horse cart, and you'll see some photographs of that. The college charter then is moved to Clarksville, Arkansas, and you know Cane Hill College today as the University of the Ozarks. So that's why you'll see the University of the Ozarks claims to be the oldest college in Arkansas. And it says, in fact, they just released some new logos, and at the bottom it says 1834. Well, that's the establishment of Cane Hill School. I was really uh, pleased to see that they had released that new logo and a little shout-out to Cane Hill in there. The third really big facet of, of daily life in Cane Hill became industry. We only have a couple hundred people in town today, so you don't think of it as such. 
But it was a booming community in the 1880s on, even 1850s, as early as 1850s. Uh, the milling industry was certainly one of the largest. And it's the reason that the, uh, the Battle of Cane Hill occurred. It's a very agriculturally rich resource area. We had at least five mills in operation throughout Cane Hill. Everybody thinks of the mill that's there today, but it's a very modern mill, a very recent mill. Uh, Mark Bean uh, had his mill in place just north of Cane Hill by the 1830s or 1840s. Uh, John Rankin Pyatt established his, him, his mill north of Cane Hill by 1838. And these mills are all obviously grinding uh, flour and they're, they're, making, they're grinding corn and grinding wheat for flour but they're also cording wool and sawing logs, according to some of the, the records that they were doing. So a lot of industry with the milling uh, that was going on there. This is a wonderful uh, 1894 Washington County Atlas by Gordon Skelton, 1894. And you can see some of those mills that I just mentioned. There's one up to the northwest, probably Mark Bean's mill. This is probably that early Pyatt mill. Uh, this is probably Kid's Mill or another one south of town. This is not the, the modern one that's there yet. It's not established until 1903, 1904. But you can see a very dense downtown. It's even cross-hatchered, so they don't even bother labeling individual buildings. It's that dense that they, they notice it's a, a pretty dense downtown. And then you'll see Cane Hill College grounds just to the northwest of the downtown. And this is a wonderful map, and we're starting to use this now as far as uh, restoring the landscape in Cane Hill and what we're using it for. And uh, these are row crops. Uh, that you see out here, or they are uh, pasture lands. But these, however, these little dots, these are wonderful, wonderful examples of orchards. So we know right where a lot of the orchard uh, industry was. Again, pretty busy happening place. This is 1907. This is even after Cane Hill was on its decline. Uh, they, they were on their decline after the 1890s, and certainly by the 1900 mark, they were on their way down. Uh, but in 1907... I know you guys have a copy of this here at the Shiloh Museum. We have some originals down there. And on the back, if you, if you guys know the story on the back of this, uh, Cane Hill has visitors from the USDA in 1907. And they're there because we apparently had just a giant apple crop that year. And so they're there to see what's going on. But you can still see in 1907, these carts are unloading apples into this storage shed. And that's what these carts are all full of as apples are backing up. And they've got hay in there to keep those apples from bumping around and getting bruised. But people in Lincoln are already shipping these by rail car at this time. And same with up here at Springdale, Rogers. So Cane Hill just can't compete much longer after this. And, and really the depression is, is the end of Cane Hill. Another large uh, industry that was going on in Cane Hill from the 1860s up until the 1880s was Wilbur Pottery or Boonesboro Pottery uh, or, or ads for this. This is the kiln location. This is just south of the college, north of the uh, Pyatt Moore Mill that's there today. But this Boonesboro pottery was pretty widely distributed, and I think you guys have a few pieces in the collections here. Yeah, we've got five or six complete examples uh, in our museum in Cane Hill. Several local folks still have pieces. The Arkansas Archaeological Survey has done a survey there and collected representative sherds or broken pieces from there. So. Pretty widely distributed pottery. And really then the, that goes along with industry and the fourth big tenant of everyday life for folks in Cane Hill was indeed agriculture. It goes right along with that and the milling industry. Uh, and while they were milling a lot of products, uh, apples were the big crop in Cane Hill. And really before Lincoln had an apple festival, Cane Hill was one of those early apple centers. Those first settlers brought apples with them and they quickly established orchards uh, the National Register nomination for Cane Hill mentions three varieties specifically that are local to Cane Hill, and those are the June Wilson, the Shannon, and the Howard Sweet varieties. And so these are very early 1830s, 1840s apples. We've started replanting the Shannon apples that you see here. Uh, we found a, a nursery in, that does southern heirlooms in northern Georgia. There are no Shannon apples left in Cane Hill, so we're slowly bringing them back in. And we've also been planting a lot of Arkansas black apples. So that's, that's more, I think, of an 1880s apple. So it's, it's kind of towards the end of Cane Hill's success. But certainly this, this Shannon is. So we've had plants in the ground now. I think this will be year three, and you can expect to get apples in year five. So we're hoping to see 
maybe a few apples next year, but certainly by the following year we'll see some of the first Shannon apples back in Cane Hill in, I don't know, 100 years, 80 years, something like that. But the other big thing that goes along with that is it put a lot of folks to work. So these are from up here locally. These are Rogers and Lowell, Arkansas. But everything was done by hand. From So you got to think it put a lot of people to work in Cane Hill. you got to pick the apples. you got to uh, clean the apples. But then they are peeling them, coring them, slicing them. They're putting them in dryer or uh, drying barns. And then they are shipping them. So to ship them, you need a barrel maker in town, a stave maker. Cane Hill had a stave maker. You need a blacksmith to construct the hoop. So it put a lot of folks to work, and it was a big industry, certainly in Cane Hill. Cane Hill still celebrates this agricultural heritage, and they have the Harvest Festival the third weekend in September. Uh, this will be the 30th annual Harvest Festival, but prior to 30 years ago, they called it the Old Pioneer Days, and so it's really been around since the 60s they've been doing this. Uh, they grow sorghum cane on site. It's there on the college grounds, and they cook it down and make molasses the day of the festival. It's really a big draw for folks to see that still made. They have a mule on site that turns the, uh, the press, and they've also got the belt-driven press, like a Pop and Johnny style. So come out. It's, it's September 17th and 18th this year. Uh, Saturday is always all-day bluegrass. Sunday includes a lot of gospel music. A little bit of additional history about Cane Hill that's often overlooked or a little, little known is Happy Holler. It's the area just east of the mill site as you're on Highway 45. And Happy Holler was the enslaved African prior to the Civil War uh, community and free black community post-Civil War. Uh, they migrated out of Cane Hill uh, following the Civil War. They took jobs in Lincoln, primarily on the railroad, and then they began to take jobs in Fayetteville. And our last remaining resident, Eddie Bryant, passed away in 2004. And this is her uh, house that's there on Jordan Creek today. This was taken, I think, last year. So it's, it's in pretty bad shape. And uh, then the traditional African-American uh, burying ground is Bean Cemetery, which is National Register listed. That's in Lincoln, Arkansas. And so after the Civil War, a lot of the African-American community was, was buried there in Lincoln. Uh, Cane Hill, though, the reason that we're here is Cane Hill is home to a very significant collection of architecture, one of the most significant in the state. We have 16 properties that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So in a tiny town of just a couple hundred folks per capita, that is incredibly high, maybe second only to historic Washington State Park in South Arkansas. <coughs> the really cool thing about Cane Hill, though, is it has a, a wonderful range of architecture. So oftentimes you see a town develop, and they have a very similar style. Uh, since Cane Hill has been occupied for so long, we have a very long uh, architectural record uh, spanning from 1850s Greek revivals, some of our first houses, you know, beautiful Gone with the Wind style, what you think of, uh, up to Victorian 1880s and 1890s, like you see on the Edmiston House there. Uh, uh, Victorian, you see the church is Gothic revival. Uh, the Zeb House is a Greek revival cottage. Uh, Victorian commercial downtown. Uh, we also have the college building itself is Italian 8. So if you ever need a study in architecture, you just come out and you, you can look at each, each building and learn a little bit about the styles. A little bit of history of, of our organization. Uh, the college was closed in 1891, like I said, and it became a primary school again. And it continued to be used for a primary school for grades 1 through 12 up until the 1940s and it, when they consolidated the elementary schools, and then until the 1950s when they consolidated finally all the high schools and elementary schools. And that's why if you ever see a, the side of a Lincoln bus, it says Lincoln Consolidated Schools. So Lincoln has, I think, it's the second largest school district in Arkansas area-wise. They consolidated Summers in Cincinnati, uh, Cane Hill, Clyde, Morrow, all those little towns into one school there in Lincoln. So the college closed, and then this is gone by the 1950s, and there starts kind of a loose-knit uh, community group that takes care of the college, and they, it becomes a community center. In the 2000s, they formalized themselves into the Cane Hill College Association, and they uh, became a 501c3, a nonprofit that was responsible for the college itself. And then in 2013, we had some wonderful changes that took place and we renamed that nonprofit to Historic Cane Hill, and we expanded our mission statement to take care of some of these other buildings. 
Uh, almost all of those uh, were extremely uh, in extremely bad shape. Uh, just deferred maintenance, uh, abandoned, you name it, all kinds of variety of reasons. Uh, so our hallmark project is restoration of the Cane Hill College. That's our cornerstone project. Uh, that 1886 building that I, I showed you here. Uh, there's the, the picture that we started out with. And just over the hill, you can see the college there in the background. And this is, we have a great setup of early photographs of the college from the 1880s up to the 1920s. Uh, however, uh, with most organizations like that, as it becomes uh, pretty serious over time, is it takes a whole lot of money to take care of buildings. Uh, the Cane Hill College had significant cracks. This is on the west side. We called this the Grand Canyon. You could see all the way through. The daylight was uh, about half an inch, three quarters of an inch through there. And you can see some of these cracks. So we uh, automatically started with crack monitors to make sure these weren't getting any larger. You can see a crack monitor there. And then we started some geocores, some soil samples, to try to learn about the bedrock and the soils that are there, why the building was moving and how it was shifting. And we started with a series of helical piers. These are, they look like a post hole digger on the back of a tractor. And these are screwed down to bedrock, so between 8 and 20 to 30 feet deep. And they're filled with high pressure uh, concrete. And then they're encapsulated in concrete blocks underneath that foundation. And there you can see this. And there are a series of 24 of those now around that foundation to hold it up, to keep it stable. Uh, we then started on the, the process of uh, our phase two is the restoration of the exterior of the building. Uh, the building was in uh, pretty bad shape by, by the 1930s when they were having primary school in there again. And so they had a great idea to change out all the windows and doors. And they did this where they ripped out all of those beautiful Italianate windows, those triple hung windows and double hung down there. And you can see where they bricked them up with bright red modern bricks and Portland cement. And Portland, hard Portland cement and old time soft mortar don't get along. And so that's where a lot of that cracking began in 1931. And you see some of those cracks. So they took, uh, you can see all those bright red bricks where they ripped out those old windows. And all it did was allow water and rain and moisture access every place they did that. Uh, we then started restoring all of those original openings that you can see here, pulling them back. Uh, this is the north side. This is the north elevation. You can see some of these. And it's a wonderful example of 1930s alterations. This was the depression. This was use what you have. So this sash, the bottom sash, the window panes went left and right. The top sash, the panes went up and down. So, you know, we can't, we can't hold this against them. This, they were doing everything that they could in 1931 to keep the building usable and going, but it really created some long-term problems. That's the north elevation today as it looks. We finished all the restoration of the outside. There's the east elevation. You can even see where they removed the original front door. You can see where they've ripped out there. There's back to the east elevation today uh, with these original brows over the windows true to the Italianate style of architecture. And you can see those right back there. And there's the original front door. So we used uh, a lot of these old photographs in our restoration. And then one of the best, and one of the, or I guess you could say one of the worst, was the south wall right here. And you can see this major structural crack that was a lot worse once we got into it. And the second floor is a big, beautiful auditorium that's been closed for a decade because of structural concerns. And yes, all of these joists were barely touching if they were touching anything. That wall had pulled out and separated. And so it's back today. And there are steel beams, and this is reinforced uh, and, and re-engineered and looks like it should in the 1880s again. In 2013, uh, this house had been sitting vacant for a long time, and we acquired this. This serves as our office in Cane Hill. It is National Register listed, constructed in 1896. Uh, it was always maintained. It was not one that we had to restore, so it's, it's stayed very well over the years. And it was built by John Edmiston, one of the younger brothers. And also in 2013, we acquired the A.R. Carroll Drugstore. Uh, when we closed the college, we didn't want to change any cultural activities in town. So the Harvest Festival meetings, they do quilting once a month. They do um, all kinds of, of activities that have gone on forever. So we opened up the drugstore 
uh, for folks to continue having meetings and use. Uh, they just had a family reunion Sunday in there, the Bailey family reunion in the drugstore. And they had typically done that in the college in the past. And it's a three or four year project. So uh, when we acquired it, it looked like this. Uh, this is an 1890s, oh no, I'm sorry, this is a 1910 picture of that approximately. And it looked like the, a bad episode of that TV show Hoarders inside. You know, it had been abandoned, it had been really neglected. So we restored that pretty quickly in 2013, and it's open now. Again, people come and use it, and uh, it's a wonderful facility. Sometimes we have our board meetings there or family reunions, or we have all of our festival meetings there. It's on the National Register. Uh, I should say the upstairs was the Masonic Lodge Hall. In 2014, we acquired the Shaker Yates Grocery Store, also sitting empty. This is the drug store sitting here on its right. There's the Shaker Yates Grocery Store. Also in pretty sad shape. You can see the drugstore in the background. And so we restored the facade, just cleaned it up. It's amazing. Just a little bit of paint and a little bit of elbow grease can clean up buildings. That, that is a facade improvement. And it also gave us a wonderful place to move all of the items from the Cane Hill Museum, which was in the top floor of the college. Uh, it, you saw it's a significant construction project. We didn't want any items damaged or, or walking off in that process. And we wanted to keep it open. The other problem, it was in the top floor of the college with no elevator, with a town of uh, average age of about 65. So it's now on Highway 45. It's on the first floor, much more accessible. Uh, it's its own dedicated building, and I think it's going to stay that way from now on. I don't think it'll move back to the college. Uh, just behind those two buildings, uh, visitors need restrooms, and you don't need restrooms in every building in Cane Hill. Uh, so I love something in preservation we call adaptive reuse. In 2003, the Masons abandoned their lodge in the top of that building. It had become too steep for them to climb the stairs, and it was just in too bad a shape. So they built this building in 2003, concrete block building, kind of an eyesore. And they disbanded in 2009 because there were just too few of them, and they joined the Lincoln Lodge Hall, and they donated this building to us. It had been sitting totally unused since 2009 and so I came up with a design uh, to reflect back to all of those barns that were starting to lose in western Washington County and it's uh, been restyled to include a hayloft and it now serves as our restroom facility so adaptive reuse use a building that you've already got and it's based on some local barns these are all local barns and you see those haylofts these are either gone now or, or very close to being gone and then the inside of the building is built almost entirely out of salvage materials from other jobs. So you'll see leftover sheet iron, and there's a couple old, old photographs. But all the trim and stuff, it's all, almost all salvaged in adaptive reuse. Another example of adaptive reuse was a guy's 40 by 40 plumbing shop that was a foreclosure. They were able to remove the metal sides and reframe with 6 by 6 cedar post. And this is right beside the church. And it's a nice picnic facility. Something that goes along with that that you've seen in some of our, my photographs that I've put up is split rail fencing. Uh, that is also listed in the National Register nomination that, that uh, settlers, once they got to Cane Hill, they quickly made use of locally available materials. And they mentioned primarily native sandstone for building and cedar for split rail fencing. So we have installed cedar split rail fencing in everything that we own in Cane Hill. It gives visitors a comfortable idea of where they can go. They know that it's Cane Hill's and that they're free to go there. And it also restores part of that landscape that I talked about. So you'll see that cedar split rail fencing in a lot of these photographs. You see all that down Highway 45 today. You can see all the split rail fencing. There's some up here, some up here. There's some along the college. And a lot of this is now back in place. And you can see some of it back in place right there. In 2015, we acquired the David Noah Edmiston House. Uh, these folks decided they were moving out of Cane Hill and uh, uh, approached us first. And it is also one that's been very well taken care of. It's not one that we've had to put anything into yet. And we're developing a plan right now, hopefully getting some folks back into Cane Hill. We did do a little work again on its garage. They built this, seemed like a good idea in 1980. But it really did not blend with our historic landscape. So we did the same thing, rough sawn oak camouflage it like a barn. It's still a functional garage and it still works really well in our historic landscape. And in 2014 we also acquired 
the Bank of Cane Hill. I wish it looked like this today. It does not. Uh, in the 1960s, this top floor, the top half was removed, and all of this wood storefront was removed about 18 feet. And it looked like this when we purchased it. And it became Jenkins Grocery Store in the 1960s. But everybody around locally still remembers it as Jenkins Grocery Store. And they stopped and got a bottle of pop and a hot dog or a bologna sandwich or whatever it may have been. And so, again, just a simple facade improvement. Clean up uh, the paint and replace any rotten wood. And it serves as our carpentry shop today. We utilize that uh, for storing materials, tools, and as we're working on projects. It's a nice place to get out of the rain. So all, all together, the dents downtown there in 2013 when I showed up looked like this. Uh, English Ivy was just about to take over the drugstore. And today, it's a, a pretty good improvement for, for such a short time. We've also worked on projects uh, in little communities around Cane Hill because they were all one interconnected community of folks that went back and forth and traded and intermarried. So we've worked at the Leach store in Dutch Mills, historically known as, um, what is it, as, as what? Hermansburg. Hermansburg, yeah, I had to think of it, couldn't think of it a second. It had fallen into serious disrepair in the, in the 1970s, 1980s, and a local guy had started doing some of the work back to it to improve it, but it's now back, and it's got a nice historical marker right there talking about the Herman brothers and the Civil War. You can go visit that one in Dutch Mills. Uh, we've also worked at the McCarty House, which is between Dutch Mills and Cane Hill. Uh, we have a great photographic record of that, thanks to family members. And in 2014, it looked like this. And in today, if you drive by, it looks like this. It's a wonderful 1870s farmstead. still has the smokehouse beside it out to the back. And one of our current projects, the Zeb Edmiston House, this was the patriarch of the Edmiston family. Uh, Zeb was the father of David Noah and John Edmiston, the guys that built those two big Victorians that I've already showed you. Zeb lived much more modestly in this 1870s Greek Revival cottage, and he had a, a shop out front on Highway 45. This is Zeb and his wife and their daughter, I believe. I haven't zoomed in enough to, to figure that out, but I think that's a little girl, and they only had one girl. Uh, it's had some serious problems in the last 50 years. Uh, since 1987, it's flooded about seven or to eight times. And last year, it flooded three times. This was in June of last year. Uh, so working with our board and with our advisory board, uh, we came up with a plan. And the first question was, do you move it or do you leave it in place? And it's really the last one left on that east side of the road. And so everybody wanted to leave it in place. I voted to move it. I was the only one that wanted to move it because we can engineer it for four feet up above this and it'll flood four feet and one inch in 20 years from now. It just, no matter what happens. So this house is actually uh, being raised up in place and we're working with the Corps of Engineers now to uh, develop a plan for some stream improvement, some riprap, and planting some trees that will help at least slow this down or stop it. But the house itself will stay there. But it'll be, it's up in the air right now about seven and a half feet, and it's got a foundation underneath it, and we'll let it down in about two weeks. So it's a, a very important house, a very important family history in Cane Hill and folks that live there. And that's that dense downtown that I was just talking about, and it's the only, it sits tucked in right back behind this building, and it's the only one left on that entire side of the road. Uh, you'll also notice this one is the Edmiston & Son General Merchandise Store, one of the Edmiston family's later stores there in town. Cane Hill also has a wonderful Trail of Tears connection. Highway 45 uh, was the location of about half of the northern detachments and the binge route came through Highway 45. Uh, we believe that, and I think several researchers believe that the uh, B.B. Cannon Treaty Party, uh, they had a little girl die on that treaty party prior to the Trail of Tears. Her name was Alsie Timberlake. We have a receipt for her coffin purchased in Cane Hill. And it's likely that she's buried in the Bean Carnahan Cemetery, which is just north of Cane Hill. And we've improved that and cleaned that up. It was pretty bad shape when we started. And the Bean Carnahan Cemetery is also home to two Revolutionary War soldiers. This is Jacob Carnahan uh, and, and Pipe. 
two of the founding fathers of Cane Hill. Uh, Cane Hill has an incredibly rich Civil War history that I mentioned on November 28, 1862, where the home of what's called a running battle. The Confederates were in Cane Hill, taking advantage of all that rich agriculture that's there, and the Union approaches from the northeast. Uh, General Blunt drives out Marmaduke and Shelby back to Van Buren over a very long 12-mile battle, running battle. And the, the great thing is that the landscape, like it looked in the 1860s, still looks like this today. And this is the site of some of those first shots just north of Cane Hill. And so we've been very fortunate that development has not altered a lot of the landscape. So we're hoping to keep working with folks like the Civil War Trust and keep some of that uh, in wide open spaces. Uh, following the Battle of Cane Hill, General Blunt utilizes the Methodist manse that we mentioned earlier for his Civil War headquarters up until the Battle of Prairie Grove. And this is one building that we've now stabilized and hope to start working on as soon as we can get the Zeb House done. We've done some archaeology in there, in that area, we used some remote sensing, we've done some hand excavation and tried to learn a little bit about the history of that building. Like I said, the, the National Register listing has it at 1834, but we found uh, the contract to erect and build or cause to be erected or built upon thereon, a house or place of worship for the use of the members of the Methodist Church South. And then we also found the deed where they gave the land to build that structure from 1859. And so we're, we're thinking that that's probably, uh, that 1834 was based on local knowledge. So one of the biggest problems I have is Cane Hill has a lot more fiction than fact. These stories have just been passed on and passed on. There's a, a wonderful DeSoto story in Cane Hill. I'm sorry it's not true. There is no Spanish gold. Just like Gravit, like, like you guys' podcast on Charlie Gonzalez here, you know, he's, he was not here. Uh, we've had an ambitious goal of, of installing trails like you've seen in Northwest Arkansas. We want visitors to come out. We want to make it easy for visitors. So we have a lot of trails in place now. We have some information kiosks where you can show up in the parking lots. You can grab a trail brochure. Uh, we have some information panels. We've got four of these in place. We look forward to getting a bunch more of these in place as we get buildings done. The trail brochure is online. You can go to historiccanehill.org and you can download that brochure at home or read it at home. Uh, we've had a major increase and visitors, we reach out to folks, we want you to come to Cane Hill now, we're really proud of what we've been doing. Uh, this is the entire freshman class from the University of the Ozarks. They are going to come out every year now as part of their first year experience and see where their university started. Uh, we've done web development, so you can go to historiccanehill.org. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those amazing places on your, your phone that they, you can pull it all up now. Uh, we've done some cemetery preservation. We've hosted a cemetery conservation workshop. We've done some ourselves on, on graves like these, working with uh, nationally recognized cemetery conservators and teaching folks. But not everything is a success story in Cane Hill. And the reason that we are working at such a feverish pitch is because everything there was really right at the precipice of going away. The college, you saw how bad a shape it was. It had no more than 20 years left if it had been left alone. The manse had no more than five years left in it. The drugstore probably had no more than five years left in it. Uh, this is Fontaine Earl, a, a very well-decorated Civil War soldier. He comes back as Major Earl after the war. He's known as Major uh, after that. That's his wife. And they lived in a beautiful little Greek revival cottage south of Cane Hill. This is it when it was listed on the National Register in 19. 82, uh, still looking decent. This is what it looked like by the 1990s, and this is what it looked like three months ago. So all of these structures, they're that close, and this is National Register listed. So there are a few that have already gone by the wayside. These now still represent important information about the past. Uh, they still fit in the National Register under Criterion D, which is uh, the potential to yield archaeological information. But we have lost the opportunity there to save that structure. So we're working uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, thank you for being here today. I know it's hard to get away on a Wednesday at noon sometimes. I appreciate you being here and letting me talk about Cane Hill. If you ever want to come out, please. The museum is open every Saturday now with uh, volunteer staff 10 to 2, so 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. But you can come out any day of the week if you like, and you can stop in the parking lots. 
grab a brochure, start walking around Cane Hill and see all of these uh, buildings that we've talked about today. Uh, if you want to check us out online, again, go to historiccanehill.org. You can send me an email, historiccanehill at gmail.com, or give me a call. But thank you for being here today.